It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thanks, uh, thanks so very much, Speaker. Speaker, my first question this morning is for the Premier. The government finally came back uh, to Queen's Park, but based on their Nothing Burger budget, uh, seemed to not be prepared to get to work. Um, we uh, know that we have folks in Ontario that are working very hard. I want to uh, particularly point out nurses who are, are working their backs off uh, to try to protect us throughout this uh, fourth wave, uh, and yet they're doing so facing significant shortages caused by this government and the previous Liberal government. Speaker, they're exhausted, they are overworked, they are underpaid. So my question to the Premier is, where is the government plan? Where is the funding necessary to shore up our health care system, question. making sure that we keep our nurses and that we retain them for the, the, for the future of our province? To apply for the government, Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. Good morning, and thank you to the Leader of the Official Opposition for the question. We value greatly the work that's been done by nurses. We certainly recognize that they have gone through tremendous stress, uh, considerable overwork. Uh, in the last 18 months, and they are the ones with other frontline health professionals that really are the heroes in this entire system. So we recognize the concerns that they, they have. We did provide pandemic pay for a period of time to uh, assist them financially with uh, many of their concerns, but we also know that they are subject to uh, uh, significant stress loads, anxiety, in some cases PTSD because of some of the things that they have witnessed and had to deal with. And so we have expanded to two provide specific mental health uh, supports for nurses to provide them with the counseling that they need in Response. four locations at our major mental health centers. The supplementary question. Nurses are leaving in droves and the government hasn't shown any plan whatsoever. Similar to the problems that we have in education, Speaker, the government is not making the necessary investments in our education system. In fact, it's shocking that a full one-third of COVID-19 cases currently are in our public school system. The government could have hired more teachers, Speaker. They could have reduced class sizes. They could have supported our students when they need that support the most. And instead, they chose to cut $800 million from our public education system in the, in the throes of a global pandemic. Speaker, students, parents, teachers, education workers have had nothing uh, but silence from the government. They weren't even talked about. They weren't even referenced in yesterday's throne speech. Question. Where is the plan for safer schools, including the hiring of new teachers, education workers, mental health supports for our students. Where is that plan, Speaker? The Minister of Education, to reply. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. I'm proud to be part of a government that is investing more in public education than any government in the history of this province. Mr. Speaker, the plan has been fully endorsed by the Chief Medical Officer of Health. The head of the Ontario Science Table has suggested the plan cautiously aligns with that best medical advice. We have put in place investments that has enabled massive air ventilation improvements in every single school in this province without exception. We have ensured $600 million in mechanical ventilation improvements through the summer and the fall. We have deployed 70,000 HEPA units. We have provided take-home testing options to make life easier for those parents, for those high school asymptomatic parents, to reduce the time they're out of class. And today, with the support of the Chief Medical Officer, felt that we have gone further, Speaker, another tool in the toolkit to keep our schools safe, to keep them open, by Fine. deploying on a risk basis a rapid antigen testing program that will help ensure we keep students of this province learning every single day. Final supplementary. Speaker, that doesn't answer the issue around $800 million being cut from the education budget. But look, sadly, in fact, tragically, the same thing is happening in long-term care. There is no plan to fix our long-term care system. In fact, this government is content in continuing the same failed system of for-profit-led 
long-term care in our province, the same system that the Liberals have held for 15 years. There's no plan to hire or retain workers, just like in our broader health care system. And the wage top-up for PSWs, in fact, expires at the end of this month. And just this morning, the minister responsible for long-term care three times on CBC Radio dodged the question and refused to commit to making permanent the PSW pay raise. So my question is, why won't the government make the commitment to increase wages of PSWs permanently? Question. Because every single expert and every single report, and they know it, says that that's exactly what they should be doing. To reply, the Minister of Long-Term Care. Mr. Speaker, our Premier has made clear both his respect for our PSWs and through the wage increases we provided and the wage increases that we have, uh, we have committed to have ensured that they will get a fair pay for the great work they do. But Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition talking about not having a plan, this is a government that's here to fix long-term care. Mr. Speaker, 30,000 net new beds. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the previous government. The previous government built 611 net new beds in the 11 years, including the years when the Leader of the Opposition was in partnership with them. You know how many beds were built in Hamilton Centre at that time? Zero, Mr. Speaker. 600 beds are being built in Hamilton now, Mr. Speaker. That's a change. Moving to four hours of care, a commitment that was talked about by the previous government but never followed through on. Mr. Speaker, new funding will start to flow this year to move us to the highest levels of care. And Mr. Speaker, we'll also introduce legislation to make sure that accountability, transparency, and enforcement are what they should be. We have a plan to fix long-term care, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to the support Response? of the opposition as we debate that. Thank you. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. It's pretty tragic that the minister doesn't realize that beds are, are not going to do anything without the staffing that we need to support the people that use those beds. But, Speaker, my next question uh, is uh, also for the Premier. It's clear that this government uh, is uh, not going to make any changes. They're going to go back down the same wrong path and penny pinch all the way to the campaign. Education, as I've already noticed, or I've already mentioned, $800 million in cuts. They're going ahead with it. Students, education workers, teachers, parents, Everybody in the education systems know we need more resources, not less, in order to get through this pandemic, Speaker, but also to rebuild our education system, which this government appears to be bent on uh, tearing down. My question is, why is this Premier, why is this government, in the context that we now face, continuing with an $800 million question. cut to our education system? And to reply, the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, first off, Mr. Speaker, this Premier and government has increased investments for school boards this year compared to last year by $561 million. What the member opposite, the, what the member opposite's question actually means is the $800 million forecasted by the parliamentary budget officer speaks about compensation hikes, which obviously the NDP would give to the teacher unions, and there would not be a government standing up for the interests of taxpayers and parents. This government went through the negotiation in the last pandemic with one focus, investing more in the classroom. Over the summer, we invested $600 million more in air ventilation because of the dereliction of duty by the former government, who did nothing to improve schools, who closed 600 no less. Our government is investing in building new schools, over half a billion dollars, many new schools being built and, and refurbished in Ontario. With respect to COVID-19, $1.6 billion more and an $85 million learning recovery plan because we appreciate how important it is to keep the kids safe, keep them in school, and improve the learning quality in this province. Supplementary. Speaker, news for the minister. Parents are actually tech taxpayers as well, and they exactly. want to protect their kids' education. He should have learned that more than a year ago. Parents care about their kids' quality of education, but you know what? It's not only education cut, Speaker. Our local health uh, uh, units have been doing yeoman's work when it comes to the COVID-19 fight. They have work been working miracles in communities on the front lines as this Premier has basically gone missing. Complete lack of leadership, complete dithering, complete delay. The Premier's priority remains cutting our public health units from 35 down to 10. The government is literally restructuring our public health care system in the midst of a global pandemic. What is wrong with that picture? These folks are on the front lines of COVID-19 day in and day out. Of all the things to keep ploughing Question. ahead with, why is the Premier continuing to make cuts to health care? And to reply, the Minister of Health. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. Well, in fact, it, it probably won't surprise you, Mr. Speaker, that I disagree entirely with the comments made by the Leader of the Official Opposition. In fact, we've put an extra $5 billion into our health care system since the beginning of this pandemic. And, and far from restructuring public health during the pandemic, we've actually paused in a consideration. Mr. Jim Pine, who was doing the uh, discussions and consultations with municipalities, has stopped because of the extra work that the public health units need to do. And we have paused that until we move through this pandemic, hopefully sooner than later. But we know that the public health units need some assistance. That's why we've provided $47 million in mitigation funding so that they don't have any lack of income. We've provided them with that mitigation funding, as well as several hundred million dollars in order to allow them to continue to do the excellent work that they're Response. doing in testing and uh, case and contact management. And the final supplementary. Sir, I would agree that the public health units are doing a heck of a lot of extra work, and the last thing they need is a spit in the eye from this government with the threat of reducing them down to 10 from 35. Look, the Premier also has the tools, Speaker, to do the right thing to help the frontline minimum wage workers in our province, the essential workers, Speaker, that were there day in and day out, risking their own health, risking literally risking possible death while the rest of us were able to stay safe. Meanwhile, as they continue to toil away, the cost of living keeps going up. And the Premier's first action when he became Premier was to roll back their wages. The 10 cent increase is nothing more than an insult to the workers that we relied on during this pandemic. So my question to the Premier is, why is he okay with that? Why is he okay with workers working full-time, sometimes two and three jobs, not earning enough to pay the bills question. and put a roof over their heads? Mr. Labour, well, thank you very much. And Mr. Speaker, on behalf of a grateful province, I want to thank every single worker out there that's been working uh, every day throughout this pandemic to support our families and our communities. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we laid out uh, a plan to continue to increase the minimum wage uh, in Ontario. But, Mr. Speaker, let me be clear. We want people to be getting better jobs. We don't want to build an economy on minimum wage jobs. That's why, for example, Mr. Speaker, we're encouraging uh, people to pick up a career uh, in the skilled trades. These are good jobs that pay six figures, that have defined pensions and benefits. And Mr. Speaker, we're going to work every single day to spread opportunity widely and fairly as we rebuild uh, back a better province. Thank you. The next question, the member for Davenport. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Premier. September came, September went, with nary a peep from this government, and so with no concrete plan in place for rapid school testing from this government, parents took matters into their own hands. They acquired and they distributed rapid tests themselves as cases among kids continued to steadily climb in this province. It was a crushing blow to those parents when the Premier suddenly blocked access to those rapid tests last week and then today reversed that position. Speaker, why did parents have to crowdsource a vital tool that experts say will help keep schools safely open? And why didn't the Premier do his job and have real testing in place in September? To reply, the Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. I will confirm that the Ontario Science Table, pediatric hospitals in this province, the testing strategy expert panel, and the chief medical officer file do not support rapid asymptomatic testing province-wide. That is the position of medical authorities right across the province, including the medical officer of health in the member opposite's uh, community. Having said that, Speaker, we have followed the Ontario Science Table recommendation and adopted the updated advice by the Chief Medical Officer, who confirmed today we are launching a risk-based targeted uh, rapid testing program to public health units for them to deploy where the local indicators require it so that, yes, we can ensure schools remain safe and open. It builds upon our take-home test strategy, the PCR test strategy we've launched for high school uh, asymptomatic students. Why? Because we want to increase presenteeism. We want to reduce the absenteeism from the classroom because for mental health to learning loss Response. is so critical that we mitigate going forward. We're working closely with the Chief Medical Officer felt we've adopted this new strategy as another tool in the toolkit to keep schools open in this province. And the 
Mr. Speaker, the abdication of responsibility by this minister is appalling. They have downloaded decisions, they have downloaded costs, and they never take responsibility for a single thing, Speaker, in that vacuum of provincial leadership to make schools as safe as possible. Schools now account for one-third of the active COVID-19 cases in this province. There were 250 more cases today, and six more schools are closed. The chief medical officer of health himself said today that targeted rapid testing could help prevent painful closures in areas of high risk. Every day, Mr. Speaker, we are hearing about class sizes that are larger than pre-pandemic levels, cohorts mixing as classes are collapsed, recognizing that increased risk to children in crowded classrooms. Will these schools be included in the rapid testing program? To reply, Mr. Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In the midst of the Delta-driven fourth wave, five and six schools, elementary schools in Ontario, do not have an active case, and four to five schools in high school in our province do not have active cases. The Chief Medical Officer confirmed this morning that the cautious protocol is working to keep transmission low and schools safe, and we appreciate the partnership of everyone. And I should acknowledge on Rural Teacher Day our gratitude for our educators for working so hard with our government and public health units to keep schools open and safe and to ensure children remain engaged in learning. Today, the Chief Medical Officer have adopted a, another tool in the toolkit by launching a program designed and targeted for those schools at risk, based on a balance of metrics, including schools that will have high case rates and may have low vaccine rates. Mr. Speaker, we are relying on the expert advice of public health units to deploy those tests. We've launched a province. Response. We've launched a take-home test across uh, schools in this province for high school students to make life easier. We've expanded testing options. We've worked with the Ministry of Health to reduce the wait times, and we're going to continue to stand ready to do whatever it takes to keep schools safe and open Ontario. Thank you. The next question. The member for Flamborough Glanbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Education. This past year, we have seen a renewed focus on the horrors of residential schools and the treatment of Indigenous peoples. Last week's inaugural day of truth and reconciliation was an important step in acknowledging parts of Canada's past, but as we can all agree, more needs to be done. Minister, last week ahead of the first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, you made an important announcement to enhance Indigenous learning with the curriculum. Awareness of the past, but also the histories, cultures and contributions of First Nation, Métis and Inuit individuals, communities and nations in Canada is an important step in taking action towards reconciliation. Minister, can you share further information on these important changes? Find the members to make their comments to the chair, Minister of Education, to respond. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Glanbrook, uh, Glanbrook for her leadership and for her commitment to ensuring that children continue to learn about our Indigenous history. Mr. Speaker, I am grateful uh, for the voices of Indigenous leaders in this province, First Nation Indian and Métis, who have spoken clearly that the, a generation of students, including myself, have not learned, did not learn about the painful past of the residential schools within our publicly funded school system. That is unacceptable, I think, to all members of the legislature, which is why we have built upon actions over the past years to expand, to enhance, and to mandate compulsory learning in this respect, to strengthen learning and understanding of Indigenous contributions to Canada, their vast, rich history, and their culture and language. In addition, Speaker, I think most especially this year, a recognition we must do more to expand mandatory learning for, on residential schools. Response. It's why, Speaker, I was proud to stand with the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, including chiefs and elders in the First Nation uh, community, to expand learning from grades one to three in this province to ensure no generation of students, that no student in this province, graduates our. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, we recognize with greater awareness comes greater understanding, and this is a substantial step in the right direction. This government is utilizing education to empower our Indigenous youth to reach their full potential, just like we do with every other student across the province. In addition to the curriculum announced, our government also shared that we are increasing investments to support Indigenous students' success right across Ontario. Minister, can you please share with this legislature what other meaningful supports our government is providing to Indigenous students now and through the future? Mr. Education. Thank you very much, Speaker. And to support 
Uh, uh, our journey in reconciliation, we have announced additional funding to support First Nation uh, Métis and Inuit student success in Ontario. We take this seriously, the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and I have met with the uh, Council of Chiefs, where we have the Chiefs of Ontario, where we have made clear that the funding will increase, and not just that it will increase, but it will be sustainable. One of the big asks of many uh, stakeholders within this community was clear that they need long-term funding agreements. And we have accepted that recommendation to move to three-year funding to provide sustainable outlooks. A $23 million investment was announced, partially to support student mental health within the Indigenous student mental health community, partially to support the expansion of Indigenous uh, graduation coaches to help young people within the community graduate, access higher learning, and get access to good paying jobs. We want to ensure they succeed, which is why we're investing over $96 million Thank in the you. education grant to make sure they Next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Mon Shong is a long term care home in my riding. It's one of the few homes in Ontario that provides services to Chinese communities in their language. The pandemic hit Mon Chong particularly hard. A third of the residents died of COVID-19. It was a tragedy because it was a preventable tragedy. It is over a year later and problems still exist. Recently, I met Agnes. Agnes is the chair of the family council at Mon Chong, and her mother has been living in Mon Chong for many years. She told me about the chronic staff shortage and how it has made it very difficult for the PSWs in Mon Chong to provide her mother with the care that she expects. Agnes is particularly concerned about the length of time her mum goes between being cleaned and other kinds of essential care. And the reason is this. During the day, there is only one PSW for 10 residents, and at night, at night, there is only one PSW for 23 residents. It is simply impossible for one PSW to provide good care with these kind of staff ratios. Question. My question is to the Premier. When will you allocate more funding to recruit and retain more PSWs to work in Ontario's long-term care homes? And to respond, the Minister of Long-Term Care. I thank the member for that, uh, that question. And I, last night, as it was, I was uh, with Stephanie Wong and Andre Barros, who are the CEO and uh, chair, respectively, of Monchong, which is a, a very high-quality provider of, uh, of services for many years. And, uh, you know, they were sharing uh, obviously the challenges, but also the opportunities of, of what we're doing as a government. Mr. Speaker, the, the member asks a very important question about, about staffing. As I've had the opportunity now to tour uh, many of the homes across the province, the number one issue, people care about new state-of-the-art facilities. They certainly care that we put in place the accountability and the enforcement required, but the number one issue they talk about are people, caring, compassionate staff. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, this government committed uh, to four hours of care, moving from 2.75 uh, hours of care. And, and that, when you talk about hours of care, that all sounds kind of a bit airy-fairy. But when it comes down to people, Response? Mr. Speaker, the answer to the member's question is, next month, Mr. Speaker, we will start our move towards the funding of that additional hours of care. Mr. Speaker, the first of those 27... Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question. Uh, back to the Premier. This government has made a lot of promises to fix long-term care, and I'm already hearing some more promises there. New beds, more staff, tougher regulation to ensure operators provide adequate care, better protection from COVID. But here's the problem. Ontarians have heard these promises before, and they don't trust this government anymore. Because when we talk to staff and family members, it becomes very clear that very little has changed in the homes. The quality of care that residents receive is still not adequate. Family members with loved ones at Mon Chong and at homes all across Ontario want to know what exactly is your plan to guarantee four hours of staffing care for every single long-term home resident. Minister of Long-Term Care. I thank the member for her, for her thoughtful question. You're right, Mr. Speaker. Ontarians have heard about fixing long-term care for a very long time. Mr. Speaker, it was 2011 when the previous government first talked about moving to four hours of care, but, but it was a tough problem to solve. Mr. Speaker, we need the people. That's why we've invested over $207 million in training more PSWs. For the first time in a very long time, 2,000 new nurses, Mr. Speaker, because we need the staff, but we also need the commitment to the funding. And that's what we have made, Mr. Speaker. And as I said, starting next month, 
homes will start to see that funding. They will start to see the clarity of how they can start to hire. And we're not done helping. Mr. Speaker, we need to continue to work with my colleague, the Minister of Colleges and Universities, my colleague, the Minister of Education, educating more PSWs, making sure that more nurses are available. Mr. Speaker, this is a government that's going to fix long-term care after decades of neglect. Next question, the member for York Centre. Thank you. Good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Over the last few months, I've heard from thousands of Ontario workers that they're facing termination because of their vaccination status. Thousands have already lost their jobs. Anita Davis is a nurse with the London Health Sciences Centre. She was joined in the studio with me this morning. She'll be terminated at the end of the month. Now, the minister prides himself for standing up for workers' rights, but does he agree that we shouldn't force Ontarians to decide between their health care and their ability to feed their family? Because we have a catastrophe on our hands. Because hundreds of thousands of families are about to suffer. So my question to the Minister of Labour, will he join me this afternoon and support the passing of, our, of my PMB, the Job and Jabs Bill, which if passed would prevent the termination of potentially hundreds of thousands of workers, or will he join the NDP, block my bill, and sentence hundreds of Ontario families to unemployment? To respond, the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, we're going to continue to take uh, a balanced and measured uh, approach when it comes uh, to uh, uh, dealing with uh, COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, the, the health and well-being of all of the people uh, is our government's uh, top priority. And I'm proud to say uh, today, Mr. Speaker, as we encourage everyone uh, in Ontario who's able uh, to get vaccinated, uh, more than 87 percent of individuals um, have been uh, have received one dose, and more than 82 percent have received uh, both doses. Mr. Speaker, this is how we're going to uh, defeat uh, COVID-19. It's by getting vaccinated. It's by working together. It's employers and employees uh, working together every single day to get through this pandemic, and all members of this House, of this Legislature, have a responsibility to also set good examples for the people of this province. Supplementary. Speaker. Back to the minister, no one is working together. People are being let go right and left. I don't think the minister appreciates the gravity of the catastrophe Ontarians are faced with. My petition, Choice Shouldn't Lead to Unemployment, in support of my Jobs and Jabs Bill, is at 146,000 signatures. Nurses, teachers, police officers, fire and paramedics, retail, dining, professionals from all disciplines who made a lawful choice. And for the record, we all agree that it is still a choice. Hundreds of thousands of them are about to lose employment. It's not the people. It's the vaccines that are supposed to protect us from COVID, which is why most of us made the decision that we did. But we shouldn't force Ontarians to do anything against their will. If the minister wants to hide behind the NDP, who don't care for workers' rights anymore, or if he doesn't want to pass my bill, that's fine. He can introduce and pass his own legislation to accomplish the same goal. But would the Minister of Labour please tell the House, will he stand up and protect hundreds of thousands of Ontarians who are Question. about to lose their jobs, or will he sentence countless Ontario families to unemployment? Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, we've been working uh, as a government with the 15.5 million people every single day since this global pandemic hit the province to protect the lives of more than 15 million people uh, in this province. And Mr. Speaker, that's why uh, we brought in the most comprehensive uh, paid sick days plan in the country, 23 days uh, for workers uh, in this province to get vaccinated, to recuperate uh, from vaccinations. Mr. Speaker, it's why we've invested uh, to hire 100 more health and safety inspectors to go into workplaces to keep workers and customers uh, safe. It, it brings the inspectorate to the highest level in provincial history. It's why we've uh, dedicated millions of dollars to building hundreds and hundreds of resources for every single business to bring in protocols uh, to keep their workers Response. and the public safe. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue every single day encouraging people to work together to get vaccinated to lead the country like we are right now to defeat COVID-19 once and for all. Thank you. The next question, the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. The number of people touched by the long-term care system is incredible. There are about 70,000 residents, 100,000 who care and support those in long-term care, and over 600 long-term care homes in every corner of the province. 
It includes the 392 people living in the three long-term care homes in my community in Richmond Hill. Over the summer, I heard members of the opposition claim that our government wasn't doing enough to support our seniors in long-term care. Minister, can you please update the House on the status of the long-term care investments? Good. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the member from Richmond Hill, I know she dedicates herself fully to her constituents, and I am happy to say that after decades of neglect, this is a government that has a plan to fix long-term care. Um, as I mentioned, between 2011 and 2018, the previous government built 611 net new care beds. None, uh, unfortunately, were in the member's constituency of Richmond Hill. Uh, that's why our government committed to, to fill that gap, 30,000 net new beds, $2.6 billion already allocated. And Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to say that part of those beds are 120 new beds, the Care First Campus of Care that's scheduled for construction in 2022 in Richmond Hill. Um, I had a chance last night again within a round table with Helen Young and Shellen Naismith from Care, Care First Seniors Care to thank them, through them, their staff, for the work that they're doing. And Mr. Speaker, we're going to support People like uh, Helen, people like Sheila, people who are working in long-term care to make sure that state-of-the-art facilities are there for our residents. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the minister for that response and for his and this government's commitment to fixing the long-term care. Those new beds will go a long way to supporting our most vulnerable citizens in my community and across the province. But, Minister. While building new beds is a vital step in fixing long-term care, ensuring the well-being of our seniors goes beyond simply building a bed for them. It is important to ensure that the cultural and spiritual needs of our residents in the long-term care are met as well. Minister, can you please tell the House what our government is doing to ensure that the cultural needs of our seniors are met? The Minister of Long-Term Care. And I thank the, the member for her, for her question. Mr. Speaker, I couldn't agree more. One size doesn't fit all when it comes to long-term care. And with our additional funding, with our development program, uh, with our focus on accountability and transparency, we will make sure that homes fit the residents. And that's why there's 18 different projects representing over 2,900 beds targeted specifically at cultural communities, where that cultural and faith the community that has been so important to uh, people during their lives can also be important during their elder years. Mr. Speaker, that includes the Monshang Stouffville Long-Term Care Home, uh, 320 safe new beds, uh, modern beds in Whitchurch Stouffville that I was pleased to be with the Premier as well as the House Leader uh, and others to be at the opening of uh, months ago. Mr. Speaker, um, we will stay focused on long-term care and we will make sure that the solution fits the changing nature of the residents and the population of Ontario. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Kiwetanong. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Speaker. Since this government uh, took office, their message on reconciliation with Indigenous people, when we get one, is inconsistent. The legacy of Indian residential school belongs to everyone, and the people need space and time to learn. We had a chance to do more to properly commemorate this day, and this government did nothing. Will this government do the right thing and uh, make September 30 a public day of healing and reconciliation? To reply on behalf of the government, the government has to. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, I must admit I, I'm somewhat surprised to have that question from the member. He did call me in advance of the day uh, to let me know that that was not a day that the community uh, had decided upon and that he was actually working on a bill that he would be bringing forward at some point in this session. Uh, and uh, I, I told him at that time that I would continue to work with him on, uh, on that bill as uh, would, uh, would, uh, would the minister. So, uh, um, uh, look, I continue to be open, as I know as the Minister does and the Premier, I continue to be open to working with you, but uh, uh, again, I, I, I understood you on the day when we had that discussion that uh, you had, had consulted with uh, the community and that uh, there was a, a different desire at the time. Remind the members to make their comments through the Chair. Supplementary question. Total misunderstanding. 
Mr. Speaker, uh, genocide is a big deal. If 20,000 non-Indigenous children died after being stolen forcibly from their parents and communities, we would not be having this debate. The horrific legacy of Indian residential school belong to everyone now. Canada and Ontario can no longer hide or turn away from the truth. Again, uh, Ontario had its chance to do the right thing and properly commemorate this day. But as, as usual, when it comes to Indigenous peoples, this government let us down. This government did nothing. Speaker, will Ontario acknowledge the past and do what it should make September 30 a provincial hol holiday of truth and reconciliation? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I don't think anybody would suggest that uh, continuing to work towards uh, a reconciliation uh, with First Nations uh, has to remain a priority, not only of this government, but all members of this Legislative Assembly. But I want to be very clear, Mr. Speaker, I don't want there to be any confusion. The member will recall that prior to the House adjourning in June, I promised that we would work together on this file and that we would work with the minister on this file. Mr. Order. The member called Order. me in advance. Order. The member called me in advance of the day to suggest that there had not been unanimous support within First Nations community to recognize that as the day, but that it would be important that there be a day and that he was the member was working on a bill which he would Response. later work with me to present to this House. I remain committed to working with the member to make that happen, Mr. Speaker, as does this government and hopefully all parliamentarians. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, I think we can all agree. House Leader, come to order. Leader of the Opposition, come to order. Member for York Centre, come to order. I apologize. Member for Ottawa South has the floor. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, I think we can all agree that the anti-vax and anti-public health protests that we've seen in recent weeks at Ontario's hospitals and schools are very concerning. They're demoralizing to frontline workers and disrupt disruptive and distressing to those people, those families trying to access those services. Ontarians' access to publicly funded health care and education is something that we all hold sacred. For almost a month now, Ontario's nurses, Ontario's doctors, Ontario's hospitals, and Ontario's families have been calling on this government to create safe zones around hospitals and schools. And Speaker, and Speaker, and Speaker, the Premier's tough tweets, they're not going to cut it. So, Speaker, through you, will the government move to immediately pass legislation that ensures safe access to our hospitals and schools and protect the people that work in them? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you very much to the member for this uh, question. It is really important because we greatly value the work that all of our frontline workers in our hospitals and, uh, and our clinics have performed, and it's very, very disappointing to see protesters coming forward. Uh, it's very demoralizing for the staff, I know, to see this happening outside their windows, but no one should be prevented from going to work. No one should be prevented from entering or exiting the hospital, whether it's a staff member or someone going to see someone in the hospital or someone going in for treatment themselves. However, it is against the law for anyone to be prevented from doing that. Uh, we know that our law enforcement officers have been out there to do that. And while we can't comment on any legislation that we haven't seen yet, of course we would look at it, but we also are relying on our uh, police support and others to make sure that no one can be prevented from entering Response. or exiting the hospital. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, other provinces like Quebec and Alberta have already moved to protect access to hospitals and schools. BC has signaled to do the same. I think they basically have the same laws out there. So I know the Leader of the Opposition has put forward a bill as today, or will put forward a bill today too. I am as well. Once again, Ontario is behind. What we're asking you is just simply to take action. No one's access to a hospital or school should be impeded, nor should anyone who works in them or is trying to access it be harassed. And that's what we've seen. 
So today, I'll be putting forward a bill that would establish safe zones against anti-vax and anti-public health protests within 150 metres of hospitals and schools. And with the pending approval of vaccines of kids 5 to 11 who may be vaccinated in school, it's reasonable to expect that we could have a problem. I think that's reasonable. Question. So the government needs to act. So, Speaker, through you, will the government move to pass my bill this afternoon or pass any bill or pass the leaders office of the opposition's bill to actually protect workers and access to these vital services in Ontario. Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. And through you, I, I wish to assure the member opposite that Ontario is certainly not behind. Ontario is not behind. We have one of the highest vaccination rates in the world right now. 87 percent of people with one vaccine, 82 percent with both vaccines. However, we expect people to obey the law. We expect that people are going Order. to follow the law. It's extremely disappointing that they're not, but that's why we have law enforcement officers who are doing their job, who are understanding that there is a potential there. They are doing their job that we have been in touch with them to let them know of our concerns. It's up to them to deal with them as they have dealt with them in the past. And we will ensure that that is going to continue to happen to make sure that people are protected, to make sure that no one is prevented from entering or exiting the hospital, Response? including staff, visitors, and people going for treatment themselves. Thank you. The next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the new, minister, the new Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues, my friend. So I'm pleased to ask my friend a question. Today, uh, this month is October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and I'm sure everyone, everyone in this chamber knows at least one woman who has been on the receiving end of the breast cancer diagnosis. In my family alone, three of my family members. Last year, an estimated 75 women each day heard the words, you have breast cancer. Many incredible advancements have been made with more people surviving a breast cancer diagnosis more than ever before. Despite this, this is still the most common cancer and sadly, the second leading cause of cancer de death amongst Canadian women, my cousin being one of them at the early age of 42. Can the Associate Minister of Children's and Women's Issues tell us what supports are available for women who receive this devastating diagnosis? The Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for the question, and my condolences goes out to your family members. Uh, I know the devastating impact of breast cancer. I watched my grandmother battle from the beginning. She bravely fought through surgery, treatment, remission, and sadly, in her case, the return of the disease. Despite her courage as she fought back against the cancer, it ultimately caused her death. I know it's been said many times before, but the fact of the matter is that cancer caught early is often easier to treat and can lead to beating its outcome. I encourage everyone to remind the women in our lives, our daughters, sisters, wives, aunts, mothers, and grandmothers, to be aware of changes that could be indicative of breast cancer. If you notice something and you're not sure, speak to your doctor as soon as possible, because an early diagnosis can make a world of difference, Speaker. Thank you. And a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. You know, I've seen through the experiences of women in my family and my friends how devastating it is to receive a breast cancer diagnosis. For many women, in addition to facing the facts of they now have breast cancer, they also worry about the impacts of their diagnosis on their parents, their families, their children, their finances, and of course, their future. Minister, I recognize that early diagnosis plays a big part in positive outcomes for women fighting breast cancer. Can the Associate Minister please tell the House and the women across Ontario where they can find support and the supports they need to reduce the additional stresses that they face as a result of their diagnosis. The Associate Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for the question. Here in Ontario, there are a number of supports for anyone facing a cancer diagnosis. Through Cancer Care Ontario and your health care cancer patients can find services and treatments 
information about drug finding if it's needed, and a variety of supports for both patients and their families that are available locally. Supporting women and their families as they take on the fight against breast cancer benefits all of us, Speaker. During this Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we encourage all women to do a self-examination and seek medical advice if you notice any changes, because early intervention is key to winning the fight against breast cancer. Thank you so much, Speaker. Next question, member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question for the Premier. Uh, during yesterday's throne speech, this government offered nothing new whatsoever to help local businesses get back on their feet. While well, half of Hamilton's BIAs are in my riding, we know firsthand how vital small businesses are to thriving, vibrant communities. This summer, I visited businesses in Dundas, Ancaster, and Westell BIAs. What I heard loud and clear is that their struggle to pay the bills and keep staff employed is not over. A small business owner in Dundas shared that she's drowning in debt and losing hope, seeing that big box stores have been continually put ahead of small businesses in this government's priorities. So when will this government show up for local small businesses and not just the big box stores? The Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production. Thank you, Speaker. And it is my privilege to stand today for the first time as the Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production. And I really do want to thank the uh, member opposite for the question. I think we all here in the House can agree that our small businesses have faced incredible hardship throughout the pandemic. And that's why, since day one, our government has worked hard to support our small businesses and help them get through uh, this pandemic. Namely, through the Ontario Small Business Support Grant, we provided nearly $3 billion in urgent and unprecedented support to over 110,000 small businesses right across the province. Our Main Street Recovery Plan it was built on more than $10 billion of urgent relief and supported through the COVID-19 Action Plan. And of course, we expanded our digital Main Street program Response. to allow more businesses create and increase their digital presence. Just last week, Mr. Speaker, I was at, uh, in London and I met a young man at Richards in a clothing store for men who put his digital presence online and it not only saved his business, he's been able to grow from that. I will speak more now. Uh, unfortunately, your government's response has been too little, too late. I've heard from businesses that have been turned away deemed ineligible for the province's small business support grants for reasons that seem Order. arbitrary. Small businesses are trying Order. to rebuild, and now they're taking on extra public health responsibility without any extra resources from this government. And what's worse, some businesses are facing harassment for following and enforcing these important public health measures without, yet again, protections such as the safety legislation zone that we've proposed from this government. So. It's clear the government's approach has been failing. Is the government finally willing to listen to small businesses and the opposition and implement a third round of small business support grant payments to ensure small local businesses get the support that they deserve? Again, the reply, the Associate Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for her question. As we know, our, throughout the pandemic, our businesses have gone through such tremendous efforts to keep their customers and their employees safe. So as we entered this fourth wave of the pandemic, we implemented additional measures in public settings to help keep our province open. We need to stop the spread of COVID-19 and protect the health and well-being of all Ontarians. Proof of vaccination is required only in settings that are at the highest risk of COVID-19 transmission due to these gatherings and close contacts, such as in closed indoor spaces. Now, as the Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Reduction, I've had the opportunity to meet with many businesses in the restaurant industry, for example. Vaccine certificates, Speaker, and proof of vaccination are a temporary measure to address health and safety in the COVID-19 pandemic. Businesses have been asking for this. This allows us to not have to close our businesses again, Speaker. Thank you. Next question. Once again, the member for York Centre. My question is to the government house leader. 
close to 600,000 Ontarians have been diagnosed with COVID. Add to that an infection rate estimated at three to five times, and you have millions of Ontarians who already had COVID. But despite ample evidence, the medical establishment is scared to acknowledge natural immunity and instead subjects everyone to draconian passports and mandates. But on August 18, the government whip issued notice to government MPPs that they're required to vaccinate unless they can provide a medical exemption or a physician's note that vaccination is, quote, unnecessary by reason of past infection or laboratory evidence of immunity, close quote. My question to the government House Leader is why the double standard? Why does the government say that evidence of prior immunity is good enough to excuse its members, but not good enough to excuse 600,000 or possibly a few million Ontarians when their jobs are on the line? Mr. Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, uh, again, um, I, I want to congratulate the people of Ontario. 80 Seven percent of individuals 12 and over have received one dose. More than 82 percent have been double vaccinated. Mr. Speaker, the 15 and a half million people have been working together every single day to battle this global pandemic. And as the Minister of Health said uh, earlier today, we should be damn proud of our province, our businesses, our families, our communities. We are much better off than any other place in this country, and it's because of the people. Supplementary question. Speaker, the double standard that this government holds itself to is astonishing. What's good for the goose is not good for the government. Speaker, I support the member from Durham's right to choose, just like I've always supported choice, just like the choice of tens of thousands of young women who made the same choice as the member from Durham, but they're about to lose their job. But if the government is going to allow the taking away of choice by costing them their jobs, then everyone should be held to the same standard. I don't care to know the member's uh, medical exemption, but I do care that it's not political rules, but College of Physicians and Ontario Public Service rules that apply equally to the member as they do to everyone else. My question to the government House Leader, did he subject the member from Durham to the same standard articulated by the College of Physicians, which are wreaking havoc on Ontarians? And if so, will he instruct the member from Durham to submit her medical exemption for acceptance by the Ontario Public Service? Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue uh, as a government, hopefully supported by every member of this legislature, uh, to protect the health and well being of all of the people uh, of this province. We can be proud as a province of how we're leading the world when it comes uh, to vaccinations. We can be proud as a province how employers and employees have been working together to battle this global pandemic. We can be proud as a province of uh, the business community uh, working uh, to uh, support uh, families uh, in need. But Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to prioritize the health and well-being uh, of the people of this province uh, every single day, just like we've done uh, for the past uh, year and a half. And I have to reiterate uh, again, we've spared no expense to uh, help the Response. people through this pandemic, whether it's business supports, whether it's the record investments in health and safety uh, programs for businesses, uh, more than 100 new health and safety inspectors, for example. Again, we need to continue uh, working together and send that message out there to people. Get back to me. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Minister of Health. Families in my riding across the province no longer have access to OHIP insured eye exams. Despite months of advance notice, this government is absent from negotiations and refusing to bargain in good faith, leaving the eye care of Ontario families in the lurch. I heard from Laurel in Welland. In September, her one-year-old son was stung by a bee. His eye was swollen, and their pediatrician said he needed an eye exam to determine if he had vision impairment. Because of this government's inaction, her son still has not been able to see an optometrist. Laurel emailed me asking why her baby is, quote, collateral damage in a dispute between devalued professionals and this government's misuse of taxpayer funds. Will the minister make a commitment today to get back to the table and adequately fund eye care so that families like Laurel's receive the care they deserve? Minister Hall. Speaker, and thank you very much to the member for the question. I know this is an important issue for many Ontarians right now. We greatly value the work that is done by our optometrists in providing 
quality eye care services to children, youth, adults, and seniors, and that any withdrawal of services has been by choice by optometrists, not by the government. We continue to fund OHIP services for children and seniors. We always will. We are ready to return to the mediation table. We have signaled that and said that publicly. We agreed to the conditions that were set by the mediator, who was actually chosen by the optometrists, uh, not by the government. We agreed to their conditions to go back to the mediation table. However, the optometrists have chosen not to do so. So if you have any influence on them, I would encourage you to ask them to Response. come back to the table because we want to address their issues. We want to provide a resolution to their concerns. Order. And a supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. It's the minister's job to do her job, not mine. Uh, th this government is ignoring both taxpayers and health care professionals. I have seniors called me worrying that they cannot receive eye exams after crucial eye surgeries, putting their recovery under threat. We've heard from diabetics gravely concerned they're going to lose their eyesight. Eye care is health care. Presently in Ontario, no one under 20 or over 65 can receive an eye exam. Optometrists have been telling the government for months they would be forced to withdraw service if the government continued to pay only 55 per cent of the cost of the OHIP-insured visits, the lowest rate in the entire country. The Ontario Association of Optometrists have indicated that they have not heard from the government since early September. In May, I brought this issue to the Legislature. We're now in October. Speaker, will this government get back to the table with optometrists and put proper funding in place to ensure that children and seniors receive the eye care they need? Mr. Hill. Thank you, Speaker. Well, I would certainly reiterate that we are ready. The government is ready to go back to the mediation table. However, the Ontario Association of Optometrists is not. And so that any decision to withdraw OHIP services is being done by the optometrists, not by the government. We will continue to pay for those services, and we have also offered a, a, a resolution to this concern. We are already going to pay $39 million into their accounts. The optometrists will see the amount that they will be receiving today. They will be receiving this amount in mid-October. This is to compensate them for, as they requested, the same rate of increase that physicians would have received between 2011, when their agreement expired, to the present. We have also proposed a resolution going forward of an increase of 8.48 per cent, plus we've indicated to the optometrists that we want to discuss their overhead Response. concerns to make sure that we can come to a resolution that is fair for optometrists, but also fair to the taxpayers of Ontario. We want to also establish a special working relationship with them, whereby we will meet monthly with them. Them. We do not do that for every group, but we know that optometrists have, were not fairly dealt with by the previous government. We want to rectify that situation and provide a resolution of their concerns. And we're ready to well, next you. The next question, the member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Nice to be back. My question is for the Minister of Education. 816 schools are reporting COVID cases. That's almost 17 per cent of all our schools, and now six schools have had to close. This spread could be addressed if more parents were given the ability to administer rapid tests to their children. The Government of Ontario had several months to plan for a safe return to school, and yet the plan to distribute rapid tests is only coming up now. To stop the spread, we should be detecting COVID before it causes outbreaks, not playing catch up. So what is the minister's plan to prevent further outbreaks and school closure given the constant raise of cases in our schools? And to respond to the member's question, the Minister of Education. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. We agree it's so critical we keep schools open and safe. It's why we've introduced a layered approach following the expert advice of the Ontario Science Table, who confirmed this summer that a preventative approach that includes strict screening before children enter a school, that the enhancement of cleaning within our school facilities, a significant improvement in the air quality and the ventilation standards, which our government has undertaken, both for mechanically ventilated schools and those without mechanical ventilation, by investing $600 million in HVAC system improvement, in addition to the deployment of 70,000 HEP units that are already in our schools, in every learning space in a school without mechanical ventilation, in every kindergarten space in this province, Mr. Speaker. In addition, we've announced today another step forward, another tool in the toolkit to 
ensure we minimize disruption, we maximize safety with the deployment of targeted risk-based rapid testing to public health units for schools and childcare settings where they deem fit. We're going to continue to follow that advice to do everything possible, as the member opposite has rightfully noted, to keep our kids safe and to keep our schools open. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm concerned with the government's plan to distribute rapid testing only in hotspots or in certain schools based on risk. When the government made the determination uh, of hotspots for access to testing at the beginning of the crisis, many vulnerable areas in my riding were left out of the equation and didn't get access to testing for a long time. Will the government ensure this time that it consults with the public health units and school boards to get the relevant information to identify vulnerable areas when rapid, where rapid testing would be most helpful. And the Minister of Education. Uh, I would agree with the member opposite. In fact, we've already consulted the Chief Medical Officer of Health as recently as yesterday, spoken to medical officers of health in Ontario to get their buy-in for this program. Uh, deferring to the local public health indicators and the local expertise of our medical officers of health. We have confidence in them to deploy this rapid testing on a targeted basis where the risk requires it. We are absolutely committed to doing whatever it takes to keep schools safe and open. It's why in September we launched a take-home test program, phase one, for asymptomatic uh, vaccinated high school students in Ontario. It's why we intend to scale that program up. Also, Speaker, we have worked with the Ministry of Health to ensure that there's low barrier access points for testing within our communities, reducing the time log to get those kids back into school, to get our staff back into school working as well. And Mr. Speaker, when it comes to air ventilation, something that cannot be decoupled from the discussion of school safety, we have really made this a major priority with Response. 600 million dollars of investment, 70,000 HEPA units, and ongoing work to ensure our schools remain as safe as possible. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning.